I want you to do two things in starting here, if you could. First, turn to 2 Samuel 22. And then grab a hymn book. So in your Bible, 2 Samuel 22, we will start reading in verse 1. Read a few verses. And then find a hymn book. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing to you. I want you to turn in your hymn book to number 144. And I am going to read some of the words from the song on that page. But let's read from God's word first, and I'll tell you where we're headed. 2 Samuel 22, verse 1. Read down to verse 7. And David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. Watch verse 2. This is where we'll draw our point for tonight, our message for tonight. And he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. So we'll focus on that second point there in verse two, the Lord, my fortress. But let's read on here, read a few more verses. The God of my rock in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my savior, thou savest me from violence. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. When the waves of death compass me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God, and he did hear me out of his temple. And my cry did enter into his ears. Okay, verse 7 is a great verse. So they're all great verses here. But I'm not preaching on verse 7 tonight. But I do want to say something about it. At 2 Samuel 22. 2 Samuel 22. If you look at verse 7. These are the words of David, we're told. These are the words of David after he had been running from Saul. Running for his life. And David says, verse 7. In my distress, what did he do? In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God. And what was the Lord's response when he did that? What do you see there? It says, he did hear. He did hear my voice out of his temple and my cry did enter into his ears. Folks, I don't quite understand how I can be down here. You can be down here. We are, I can't count. We can't count the number of miles away we are from heaven. But you can speak down here and call upon the Lord way down here, a long ways away from the Lord. And does he hear you? Oh, yeah. It's a great thing. And it says there, my cry did enter into his ears. Do you think God wants to hear from us? I think he does. When we call on him for help, we are acknowledging that we can't handle whatever it is that we've got going on. You ever find yourself in that situation? You can't handle it? So folks in our world turn to all kinds of ridiculous things that don't help. It always helps to call upon the Lord when you're going through a tough time in this case it says in my distress and I think we've all been there before different degrees so let's talk about this point the Lord my fortress in times of distress you know what you need you need a fortress so kind of interesting I didn't plan it like this this is just the way the Lord laid this thing out what's today's date today's December 7th that date, certain dates, ought to ring a bell in your mind when it comes to certain things in world history or American history. Anybody remember December 7th, 1941? Pearl Harbor, that's right. So on that day, our nation was under attack. And bombed, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And as a result of that, we entered into World War II. Do you think it was important to have a fortress in that time? 
whether you were on the battlefield or whether you're here at home in America. There was a fear that we weren't safe anywhere, I'm sure, at that time. Now, all of us here were alive, except for Hayden, September 11, 2001. And I remember that day, and actually just not that day for several days, probably several weeks, have the, have the feeling of being unsafe. Do you all remember that? I just remember that everything changed on one day. And I'm sure that you back up to December 7, 1941, the American people had the same feeling. And it's a great thing to feel secure, protected, and safe. Amen? It's a distressful thing to not feel safe when you never know what's coming. So that's where David found himself. And what did he do in this time where he didn't feel safe? Same thing we ought to do. Call upon the Lord. So let me talk about this word fortress and what it means. And then we'll trace it through the scriptures here. It's, it, it appears a number of places. And I'll try to make some good spiritual application for us here tonight. A fortress. How would you define a fortress? Go ahead. Something that can protect. I don't know about everybody here, but when I think of a fortress, I think of something else associated with the military. In fact, the word fort is short for the word fortress. So here's a few forts you may be familiar with. Fort Hood in Texas, Army Base. Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Apparently they just changed the name of Fort Bragg, but Fort Bragg's in North Carolina. They got the 82nd Airborne there. How about Fort Benning, Georgia, home of the infantry? You all know this one. This is near and dear to some people. Fort Knox in Kentucky. What's supposed to be there? I mean, I know there is some there. How much there? Who knows? But gold. And when you have something in a fort, it is considered to be safe. The gold at Fort Knox is under heavy security, right? That place is supposed to be safe. By the way, I, as I was going through this, what do you do with your money? You don't keep it under your pillow, most likely. Where do you put it? Okay, a little bit better there, but where do most people put their large sums of money? In the bank. Do you know the people that handle your money at the bank? I don't know them firsthand. I couldn't tell you the first name, last name of anybody at the bank that I keep my money. <laughs> Yet it's safe there. You ever think about that? How safe is the bank? How safe is your money at the bank? It remains to be seen, I suppose. But regardless, you want to make sure that you have protection you want to make sure that you have security and a safe place. So let's start off. We're talking about the Lord, my fortress. And the first thing we're going to talk about here is uh, go over to Psalm 18. I want to try to connect this. First thing I want to talk about here is how a fortress aids the military. Psalm 18. And you'll see military terminology used over here in Psalm 18. How does a fortress aid the military? And then we'll connect that to something spiritual. Psalm 18. You'll see this is going to sound very similar to what we read in 2 Samuel 22. Psalm 18, verse 1. Psalm of David. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock. And what else? There it is again. My fortress. And my deliver. That's the same three things we saw in 2 Samuel 22. But he goes on here. He says, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Very similar to Psalm, uh, to 2 Samuel 22. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. Now, who were David's enemies? Well, you consider Saul his enemy for a time. The Philistines were his enemy. Goliath was his enemy. You think about enemies, you often think about things associated with war and the military. So go down to verse 31, Psalm 18, verse 31. You'll see a military connection here. Verse 31, it says, For who is God, save the Lord, or who is a rock, save our God? It is God that girdeth me with strength, and maketh my way perfect, he maketh my feet like hind's feet, and setteth me upon my high places. 
Now watch 34. He teacheth my hands to do what? To war. So that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. Very interesting. David there says, he teacheth my hands to war. Now was David a man of war? He sure was. Now, you don't have to serve in the military to be involved in warfare. And what's the warfare that you and I ought to be engaged in right now, every day, today? What kind of warfare? Spiritual. So all the Old Testament references to war, just about all of them are physical. How do we apply Old Testament verses on war? We understand that we are in a war, but it's a spiritual war. And actually, it's a war that's much more serious than a physical war because we're talking about a war for souls, a war for eternal things. So I'm still in introduction here. I'll get you the points here in a minute. Go to the New Testament. Let's connect this. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. You say, show me where it says we are in a war spiritually. This is the place to go. Ephesians chapter 6. Go down there to verse 10. Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on, what's he say to put on? The whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. All right. What do you know there about armor? Who wears armor? For Okay, the first thing I think of, you're right, soldiers. The first thing I co that comes to my mind when I think of armor, I think of um, a knight. With, I mean, he's covered in armor. What's a knight do, Hayden? He's a fighter. Why does he wear that armor? Well, you've got arrows and all kinds of other things coming at you. You need protection. You need safety. So we have a security guard at our school. Just give you a little example here about fortresses and safety. Our school, there's only one way that you can enter the school. And actually, that door is locked. You have to receive entry or you have to have personal access like I have on my key, on my key ring. I can get in there. I'm sure Don, where Don works, probably something similar to that. Only one way you can get in there. And really only one way you can go out. Where Actually, there's two ways you can go out where the alarm doesn't sound when you go out and the reason why is for your safety well once you get in the school we do have a security guard guess what he wears every day he wears body armor and the reason why is in god forbid this ever happened but it, it's obviously happened at schools you have uh, somebody who has a firearm he's obviously able to fend off the uh, the person that would enter the building and also protect himself with the armor so we understand that physically and we understand how important it is. I mean, a person's life is at stake without protection when it comes to things like that. Do you think we need spiritual protection? You better believe it. So what did God give us, Hayden? Right there in verse 10. What did he give us so that we have protection spiritually? Put on the whole armor of God. So let's go on through these. Verse 12. Here's where it tells you about the war we're in. Verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And then I won't take the time here, but you're probably familiar with all the different pieces of the armor of God. You've got the loins girt about with truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and so on. So all those things God gave us as saved people so that we would have protection. Here's the thing. God is not really your fortress unless you're wearing the armor of God. We need that to protect us down here. And those spiritual enemies are obviously much more dangerous than any physical enemy. So it's interesting. We go to great lengths to protect ourselves physically. We spend money on keeping our, our homes safe and being able to defend ourselves. It's important to us. You think it might be just as important, oh, more important to defend ourselves spiritually? So if that's the case, we need the Lord to be our fortress. 
Okay, so let's say you're in a battlefield. Out on the field, you, you might get involved in, a, in some hand-to-hand -hand combat, one-on-one -on -one with the enemy. But in a war, that hand-to-hand -hand combat doesn't go on hour after hour, day after day, week after week. Sooner or later, either you or the enemy or both of you, you know what you're going to have to do? You have to retreat. And on a battlefield, it's kind of interesting. We have, in foreign countries, we have different military bases. And even on battlefields, they have these things called FOBs, forward operating bases. And they're smaller. But during a battle, we'll always have to come back there. And there's three things that happen in that fortress, whether it's a small one or a big one. It's a place of safety where the soldiers refuel. They got to get some liquids and get some solid food, refuel, so they got energy. Rearm themselves, got to get more ammunition to fight. And then the third thing that has to happen is they could get a little rest. So you think that spiritually we might need to retreat to the fortress of the Lord God Almighty and refuel, get some spiritual food, rearm ourselves, get some more artillery, and how about some rest? Now you know where a great place to do those three things is? Right here. It's this place. This place is a fortress in some ways, spiritually. I mean, the Lord is our fortress. I understand that. But coming to church, you're reminded of that fact because you get out of the world. You shouldn't have to fight when you're in here. This is a place where you refuel, you get rearmed, and you get a little rest. So you can go back out and fight some more. So before we hop out into these points here, and we'll look at some more verses on the fortress. Look at your hymn book here at 144. What's the name of the song? This, is, this has got to be in my top five of hymns. A mighty fortress is our God. And who wrote this hymn? You've got to pay attention to who wrote some of these hymns. Very important people in history. Martin Luther. Okay, I would venture to say Martin Luther is one of the most important pieces, one of the most important persons in the history of the world. Well, you, you agree? Okay, maybe you don't know a whole lot about him. You ought to know something about Martin Luther. In the 1500s, the Roman Catholic Church pretty much ruled the world, politically and spiritually. And Martin Luther was uh, involved in that church uh, as a leader in that church. So Martin Luther did something that changed the course of history. Rather than trusting all the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, Martin Luther decided one day, I think I'll take some time to search the scriptures. And you know what he found in there? He found in the book of Romans and the book of Galatians a phrase that he could not get out of his mind. It just, the Lord just used that to really convict him and show him some things. Anybody know what, what the phrase that you find in Romans and Galatians that it just went off over and over in his mind? The just shall live by faith and that little statement out of the bible ran contrary to what he had been taught in the roman catholic church what he had been taught is the just have to live by doing right and you're never in a state where you know you're safe and secure because if you don't do right the lord might hammer you folks martin luther began to understand something about salvation through jesus christ a person believes on Jesus Christ, they're saved for all eternity. And also, they need nothing else other than their belief in Jesus Christ to be saved. Amen to that. So that phrase went over and over in his mind to the point where he said, he had to come to the place where he said, what I have been taught is wrong. I'm going to side with the scriptures over the teachings of men. And the next thing he did is what changed the course of history. He decided to write out what's known as the 95 Thesis. And what he did is basically called out a whole lot of the flaws in the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. He took that document, put it on the door of the church there in Wittenberg, Germany, for anybody that wanted to read it to see it. And as a result of that, the Roman Catholic Church said, uh-oh, somebody's been reading the Bible. We're in trouble. So they immediately go on the defense, or actually on the offense, and they tried to silence Martin Luther. And here's, isn't this sad? You're at a time in history where 
people trusted what that church taught them more than they trusted the Bible. And what Martin Luther did is he said, hey, isn't what God said more important than what any church says, what any man says? And he exposed them. So now people, and this has been going on for 500 years now, now people are faced with, am I going to side with what man says or a particular church teaches? Or am I going to go with what the word of God says? And folks, that's the bottom line. You're, the issue in my life and in your life and anybody is, what am I going to do with what God said? What is my final authority? So Martin Luther raised the question of final authority and it changed the course of history. We're still talking about him 500 years later. It's pretty neat. He wrote a hymn that we still sing and it's a great hymn 500 years ago. So I just want to read a little bit of this hymn. You can follow along if you want. It's a great hymn. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills, mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Who's he talking about those last couple sentences there, last couple lines? Who's Martin Luther talking about? Our enemy, our foe. Talking about the devil. Hey, you notice what he says there at the end? On earth is not his equal. Folks, I can't match up with the devil. I'll lose 100 times out of 100. So will you. There's only one person in my Bible that defeated the devil. You know who that is? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. You know how he defeated the devil? With the words of God. That's the only chance we got. Sticking to what God said. Go on here. I won't read all four verses, but I do want to read verse three. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. That's a great statement. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure. For lo, his doom is sure. Amen. One little word shall fell him. You know what he's talking about there at the end? How is the Lord Jesus Christ going to defeat the devil one day? With the sword of his mouth. Revelation 19. All his enemies when he returns for the second time. Look at the last verse. He actually alludes to this. Verse 4. That word above all earthly powers. No thanks to to them abideth the spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth let goods and kindred go this mortal life also the body they may kill god's truth abideth still his kingdom is how long forever now I left off verse two it's a great verse two verse two is about the lord jesus christ in fact he says there we're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that might be, Christ Jesus, it is he. Hey folks, I'm going to lose every time unless I go in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, unless I trust what God said over what anybody else says. The word of God's our fortress, amen? So let's take a look at some other scriptures here, and I'll give you these points to go along with the Lord be in our fortress. So go to Psalm 31. Psalm 31. When it comes to salvation, oh, the Lord is a great fortress. Psalm 31. So this first point, the fortress of salvation. Psalm 31. Look at verse 1. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in, notice what it says here, deliver me in thy righteousness now why would he say such a thing you got any righteousness of your own i certainly don't what do you have to appeal to you got to appeal to the lord jesus christ and his righteousness which was given to you if you've called on him to save you you have his righteousness none of your own verse two bow down thine ear to me deliver me speedily be thou my strong rock for an house of defense to save me for thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. I want you to notice something. At the end of verse 2, he says, save me. 
Verse 3 says, lead me, guide me. Folks, it all starts with salvation, being saved, calling on the Lord to save you. After you get saved, you need two things from the Lord. You got to ask him for it too. You need the Lord to lead you. You need the Lord to guide you. You think he'll do it if you ask him? Absolutely. Look at verse 4. Notice the wording here. Very interesting. Pull me out of the net that they have privily, laid privily for me, for thou art my strength. Isn't that interesting? What's a net do? Catches something that you want to keep, right? Catches fish. You catch... Uh, you ever see a butterfly net, Hayden? I guess you catch butterflies, you have the right net. Folks, uh, there's a net that you and I need to be aware of. Anybody know what net I'm talking about? Kind of interesting, the wording of that verse. The Lord knew it was coming. There's a net you got to be careful of. It's called the internet. I'm not kidding. There's places in your Bible that refer to the net and the web. I don't think that's unusual. I don't think it's by coincidence. I think it's on purpose that the Lord uh, knew that, put that in the Bible. And here today we have the internet. Can you, get, can, can you get involved in the internet and it become a snare to you, as it says there? Yeah, the, the, out of the net that they privily laid for me. Uh, can you get involved in the World Wide Web and it be a snare? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The Lord knew that was coming. All right, let's go over to Psalm 71, the fortress of salvation. Hey, if you're saved, how long are you saved for? You can't lose it. You're saved forever. I'll give you a good New Testament verse to look at. Ephesians 4.30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed. There you go, Brother Tony. Sealed unto the day of redemption. Folks, if I had to keep my salvation, I wouldn't keep it. Same with you. Who keeps you? The Lord keeps you. The Spirit of God keeps you. He seals you so you can't lose it. What a great fortress salvation is. Once you get in at Jesus Christ, you are in the safest place you could ever be. And that, that's, we're talking about eternal things. You can't be anywhere safer when it comes to eternity than being in Jesus Christ. What a great fortress he is. When the Lord comes back the second time here, he's a military warrior. He's, he's, a, he's at battle. He's defeating his enemies. Wouldn't you rather be on his side? You're going to lose. People in this world need to know they lose. It doesn't matter who else they align with. They can align with the, the smart people, the so-called smart people, the Elon Musk of the world. They can align with the rich people, the Bill Gates of the world. They can align with these muscle-bound people. We talked about The Rock last week, the guy they call The Rock. Uh, hey, all those things, physical strength, riches, intelligence, does nothing for you eternally. May benefit you temporarily in this life, but nothing for eternity. Go to Psalm 71. And uh, what you have there, Hayden, in a comment? Yes, which that book, he's not going to take that name out once it's there, is he? Amen to that. Psalm 71, good thoughts. Psalm 71, this has to do with the, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord being the fortress of our salvation. Look at Psalm 71, one. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. Deliver me in thy righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline thine ear unto me and save me. Notice we see that again. We saw that again over in Psalm 31, save me. Be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock. And what else? And my fortress. See that over and over again. But look at verse 4. I think you can make a spiritual application of verse 4. For today, deliver me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous, and cruel man for thou art my hope O Lord God thou art my trust from my youth amen a fortress of salvation the Lord Jesus Christ you're safe when you're in him okay let's go over to Psalm 91 
I'll give you the next thing about the fortress. The fortress of salvation. How about the fortress you have when you trust in what God said? The fortress of God's word. Psalm 91. Now you've already seen where it's mentioned trusting the Lord. When we say we trust the Lord, what you're really saying or what you should allude to is you're trusting in what he said. That what he said is true and that he'll keep you if he says he'll keep you. He'll protect you if he says he'll protect you. So look at Psalm 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my, there it is, fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Surely He will deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He will cover thee with his feathers. Under his wings shalt thou trust. Now watch it. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. You find God's truth right here in God's word. The fortress of the word of God. You can trust what he said. He'll protect you when you trust what he said here. Okay, Psalm 144. Another one here on the fortress of God's word. Psalm 144. God's word can be trusted. Isn't it interesting that in the armor of God, the shield of faith is mentioned. And where are you have to, supposed to have your faith? In what God said. So there's times where you got to hold up God's word to be your protection. And it will protect you. It's a shield. Uh, he says uh, that shield of faith, wherewith you're able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You know, you know what the devil's doing to me and you? you? You don't see it physically, but it's happening. He's throwing darts at you. And they're fiery darts. Something kind of interesting about that. You ever talk to a Mormon and they talk about the burning of the bosom? You ever hear him talk about that, Brother Don? If you talk to the Mormons, what they want to do when they, when they try to witness to, like, witness to you is they want to pass along to you the Book of Mormon. And what they'll say to you is, we want to leave this book with you. We want you to read it and ask God to show you some things from this book. And many of them have supposedly have experienced the burning of the bosom after reading the Book of Mormon. And they think that's a good thing. It's as if you're experiencing God when you feel this burning of the bosom. You know what I think it is? And I have scripture to back it up. I think whenever somebody opens that Book of Mormon and they seek God from the wrong, the wrong place, I think the devil says, oh, I, I got a chance here. And starts shooting those fiery darts right there. Isn't that something? Because what's right there, by the way? Yeah. And uh, the, the, the devil aims to get there, to get inside there. So real interesting. Beware of that. You don't need any other so-called holy book. You don't need the Koran for sure. You don't need the Book of Mormon. You don't, you don't even need any other English translation, do you? You need the right English translation. In the word of a king, there's power. You need the authorized version. And that's a fortress, a mighty fortress. Look at Psalm 144, verse 1. Blessed be the Lord God, my strength, which teacheth my hands to war. There it is again. And my fingers to fight. My goodness and my fortress, my high tower, my deliverer, my shield... And he in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him, or the son of man that thou makest account of him? Hey, the Lord has taken account of us. The Lord has taken knowledge of us, and he's actually equipped you so that you can defend yourself against the world, the flesh, and the biggest enemy out of all three of them, the devil. So there's the fortress of God's word. Hey, you, you, you got to understand, we're in a war. We're a war that has to do with eternal things that are far more important than what anything, anybody on the news says, any sporting event, uh, any of the religious crowd, any far more important that they would throw at you, get involved in this war that has to do with eternal things, has to do with God's word, has to do with salvation. So uh, the last thing here, the fortress of God's people, and I actually should say it like this, the fortress surrounding God's people. If you would go over to Isaiah 25. Isaiah chapter 25. Okay, let me try to connect where I'm going here and try to make it so that 
we're all on the same page. Isaiah 25, the fortress that surrounds God's people. Okay, if you're saved, you're part of the church of Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ. And as I said before, you don't have to worry about losing that. You don't have to worry about being kicked out of the church as far as being saved. That's spiritual. That's the age we're in right now. That's the church age. You don't have to worry about, oh, I might lose my salvation. Never have to worry about that. You didn't earn salvation. You don't have to keep salvation. God saved you. He'll keep you. Physically, though, I want you to think about something. And we need to be reminded of this next thing here, uh, at least from time to time at church. There's a group of people that God will have his hand on physically in the great tribulation in the future. Anybody know what group of people that is? It's the Israelites. So uh, a few different groups here of Jewish people. You got the two witnesses that come back and preach during the tribulation. Bible says over in uh, uh, Revelation 11, it says that if any man will hurt them, fire will come out of their mouth, devour their enemies. You think the Lord protects those fellows? Yeah, now eventually they die, but you know what happens to them? They rise and they ascend into heaven. Revelation 11 tell you all about that. There's one group, or there's two, two people. You also got another group, the 144,000. Revelation 7, you'll find them mentioned. And they're preachers. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, they're preachers during the tribulation that go all over the world to preach the truth. And they're all Jewish and they're all protected supernaturally by the Lord. Okay, then you got a third group. You got a remnant of Jewish believers, probably a small group, but a remnant of regular people, Jewish people that will believe on the Lord and the Lord will miraculously protect them during the tribulation and keep them safe from the Antichrist. So you remember, see if we can kind of connect some dots here. David, we started off talking about David. David was running from Saul, wasn't he? You know who Saul was a whole lot like? A whole lot like the coming Antichrist. Out to take out, out to try to destroy God's man, David. So during the tribulation, you're going to have the Antichrist, and he's out to destroy anybody who comes against him. So kind of interesting connections there. So go to Isaiah 25, and now this is going to be a prophecy. This will be future. Isaiah 25. Look what it says here, verse 9. And it shall be in that day. You want to watch in the Bible when you see that little, or those two words together, that day. It shall be said in that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. And he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest. And Moab shall be trodden down under him. Even as straw is trod, trodden down for the dunghill. And he shall spread forth his hands in the midst of him. As he that swimmeth spreadeth forth his hands to swim. And he shall bring down their pride together with the spoils of their hands. Talking about the enemies of the Jews in tribulation. Watch verse 12. And the fortress of the high fort of thy walls shall he bring down, lay low, and bring to the ground even to the dust. So now that fortress right there is not the Lord's fortress. That fortress right there is the fortress that the enemies of Israel try to protect themselves with. What's going to happen to that fortress? What does it say? It says he's going to bring their walls down. Any place in your Bible you remember walls coming down? Jericho. You know what Jericho was? It was a fortress. But it couldn't stack up with the power of God. If you remember what they did, the Lord told them, march around that city once a day six, uh, for six days. Then on seventh day, go around seven times, blow the trumpet, shout. What happened to those walls, Hayden? They just fell. Hey, man's fortress can't stack up with the fortress of Almighty God. Very interesting. Man's fortresses are nothing to the Lord. How about another place here? We'll probably end up over here. Go to Jeremiah chapter 10. You're in Isaiah. Hop over to the next book. Jeremiah chapter 10. You need a fortress. I hope you have the right fortress. There's only one that you can trust 100% of the time. That's the Lord. That's his word. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Saving power that only he has. Look at Jeremiah 10. Look at verse 16. 
Jeremiah 10, verse 16. Again, this is some more things about the future during Israel during the tribulation. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Gather up thy wares out of the land, O inhabitant of the fortress. Now, this is not the right fortress. This is a fortress that's not the Lord. Look what the Lord does with this fortress. For thus saith the Lord, behold, I will sling out, interesting word usage, sling out the inhabitants of the land at this once and will distress them that they may find it so. Very interesting there. The Lord says, uh, the fortresses of man are nothing. Fortresses of man are easily overthrown by the Lord God Almighty. We keep going here with these. There's a, a whole bunch more. I say a whole bunch more. There's probably five, six more usages of the word fortress we didn't have time to touch tonight. So I'll let you look at those on your own. But I'll close with this. You can choose to put your trust in a number of different, quote, fortresses. And a lot of people do this. A lot of people are concerned about their bank account. And that's number one on the list. Oh, I got to make sure I got plenty of money. I got to make sure it's in a safe place. Folks, how, how safe is your money? How, how helpful is your money, I should say, uh, after you die? You're leaving it for somebody else. What'd that do for you? Nothing. Benefited somebody else when you were gone. Don't choose to put your trust in your financial security or your bank account. Lots of folks put their trust in, um, oh, I'm in good shape. I got good health. I don't have anything to worry about. Folks, you're not guaranteed another day. I don't care how kind of what kind of shape you're in. Don't put your trust. Don't let your fortress be in your, your physical strength or your own health. Uh, a lot of folks think that um, if things got really sideways here in America and it became very dangerous to live here in America, well, here's what I'll do. I'll get plenty of, plenty of weapons and I'll make sure I get safe hold up in my house. What's going to happen when you run out of bullets? What's going to happen with, when somebody has a, a weapon that overpowers your front door and your windows? You're no longer safe. And I don't say that to be funny. I say that to be, get us a, do a little reality check here. None of those things I mentioned are eternal. But when you choose to put your trust in the Lord and make him your fortress, make God's word your fortress, let the Lord Jesus Christ be your fortress. You are always and forever safe. So, let me ask you here. You got the right fortress? Only one that really matters. Only one that's always safe. And that's God and his word, the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you have here to close here, Hayden, before we pray? That, oh, that's a good one. That Titanic, that's a really good illustration you bring up. The Titanic was the unsinkable ship until it sank. Yeah, and you, you read some of the material on the Titanic, and I don't know if it actually was, has ever been documented as being said, but the captain of the ship sure had a lot of trust in that Titanic never sinking. Now, I can't remember the exact wording that he may or may not have said, but there, I'm sure he wasn't the only one that said, Nobody can sink this ship. And lo and behold, the, the, the Lord knows how to, how to bring a man down in his pride. And uh, there's only two kinds of people in the world. Those that are humble and those that are about to be. The Lord knows how to take care of folks when they, when they become prideful. So make the Lord your fortress. You never go wrong. So let's pray together. I want to thank you, Lord, for this time spent looking at scriptures that are always encouraging. We could read these a hundred different times and a hundred different days and they have the same effect. We thank you that you've given us your word. You're the one that has kept your word all these years. You've preserved it for us. And you're the one that always tells the truth, never lies to us. And we can always trust you. I pray as we go out of here, we just be refueled, rearmed and rested to head off into the world and Take on whatever enemies you might have that we uh, need to defend ourselves against and even go on the offensive against. Protect us as we go from here. Keep us safe. May our trust be in you and not in man or any other thing. We ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.